and as well, she's a habitat conservation coordinator for the State Park Division 82. She graduated from Texas State University in San Marcos, where she received a BS in zoology, uh, MS in wildlife ecology, and a PhD in aquatic resources. She covered all the bases. She, uh, her field work focused on bird studies in Upper Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. She's spent 10 years working on conservation strategies for the endangered Houston toad population in Bastrop County. And she's been working as the Habitat Conservation Ballad for Texas Parks and Wildlife, State Parks Division for four years, almost four years. And she's also the biologist for the World Birding Center State Parks in the Rio Grande Valley, for Sockbet, Sterile, and Benson. Thank you for speaking to our group. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello. Very pleasure to talk with you today. Um, I don't typically drink Good coffee, cup. but I'm um, going on a 12-hour day today, so I um, might be a little jittery. <laughs> and I'm also going to be talking to you about a subject that I don't get to, to, to work with very often anymore, but like I'm super excited about herpetology and amphibians and reptiles. My background is mainly amphibian conservation, uh, working in California with the mountain yellow leg frog and then the Houston toad for almost 11 years. Um, so this is kind of my passion down here. I'm more of the, uh, the habitat specialist, so working on management of invasive species uh, of our plants that we have in the park. So grassland restoration, um, getting rid of Brazilian pepper, castor bean, all of that kind of stuff in the park. Um, I set this up a little different this time. I've been giving kind of the same presentation uh, over and over, and I know you guys are new to the class. Um, and you might have seen this before. I was a speaker series at Keith and Mazatlan, so I'm kind of giving two presentations um, since we have the time. And starting off on what I think is the interesting part of herpetology, and that's the actual research that's being done. So we'll be talking about the research that I, I've, I've been doing and have done. And then we'll go through like the, the Rio Grande Valley uh, species that we have down here, the common ones. Not every single um, amphibian reptile that we have, but the ones that you're likely to see, the ones that are Texas threatened. Um, talk about adaptations of those species. Um, I also like to talk with you and not at you. So at any time you'll have a question, please just let me know. We can make it a discussion. Um, so. As you can see, I'm absolutely a hurt freak, uh, especially when it comes to snakes. Um, the ladies in the front, I know when there's a snake in the building because all of a sudden everyone starts yelling, Melissa! And then I come running as they run back towards me. Um, and so I've gotten to work in a lot of new places. Uh, these are some North Carolina species, mole king. Um, and then this, of course, is our nasty love them, the water snake, and I've done a lot of water snake research in Texas, but man, do they bite. Uh, black rat snake, North Carolina, hognose, this is out of Bastrop <laughs> County during the FEMA cleanup. Um, Texas rat snake, that was in Bastrop. Scarlet king in North Carolina. And then my advisor always trained us on how to tube snakes using his very mean timber rattlesnake. Melissa, there was a video from here mm -hmm. of a snake weaving its way through the trees. What? Great, Great Plains rat snake. Uh, yeah, we've got about a five footer that lives out here somewhere. I think he likes to stay in the culvert. And we know he's around because the green jays start fussing like crazy. <laughs> so we'll come out and see. I think that's how Lauren saw him for the video because the green jays were fussing. <laughs> Some funny things, amphibians, amphibians and reptiles have always been portrayed in movies, and it's usually the snakes hissing, and most snakes don't hiss. And so, so I always think of the movie Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. All these when snakes. All, yeah, I'm like, okay, first of all, half of those snakes would not be making any type of noise like that. <laughs> um, but it makes for good, makes for good TV, right? Uh, one of my favorite ones, I have not yet, I was watching it one day while I was at the beauty salon my nails done. Um, but one of my favorite amphibians that we have, cane toads, they are native to the valley. So you hear negative things about them, right? They were introduced in Australia and nothing eats them, they're taking over. Um, there's a crazy movie where the baby in Australia is sitting in the yard and like the back, you know, you see the baby's back and then the cane toad like hops up and it's like the Jaws music. <coughs> um, they are, Pretty poisonous, 
and you wouldn't want your baby to, to lick a cane toad, and they have killed dogs, mm -hmm. um, but they're not the big scary. Uh, wash your hands, just don't touch them. But there's not as you, a hand. As you can tell, I am. As you can tell, I cannot not touch them. But I mean, the ones this was this was taken at Vincent Rio Grande Valley State Park, and the ones there are just are just gigantic. Um, so there's this movie of frogs. I can't remember what year it came out, but these people get stranded on this island, and they want to stay there. But the amphibians, like the cane toads, the snakes, that they don't want them there, and so slowly they kill off everybody that was stranded on this island. <laughs> And it's pretty funny, I would call it like the best B minus movie that I have that I have seen. So if you're into like Sharknado, stuff like that, that kind of caliber of, of movies, I'd say watch that. So a lot of the stuff that I've done, Houston Toad work, again we'll go in Mount Yellow Lake Frog out of California, but most of the techniques that we use, we can use for all different types of species in all different states. Um, done box turtle work in North Carolina, uh, aquatic turtle work. This is actually us at the Stare. We own a Grande State Park, um, trapping turtles. And what we were doing there was doing. Um, this was this is Dr. Molly, and uh, she was looking at movements between ponds down here, and also harvest, because up until recently, t uh, turtle populations in Texas were not protected, so people could harvest our turtles. And we, uh, she came up with the data that led to the protection of our turtle species. And then a whole bunch of herptofauna in Texas, especially um, dealing with the Bastrop County complex fire before and after. So, so some of the stuff I did, this is my research um, in Bastrop County. This was uh, pre-fire. Um, I did lose all of my research my first year. This was all burned. Uh, but that's why I spent five years getting my PhD and not four. I don't have a catastrophic wildfire. <laughs> so this is a very special herp that we have in Texas. Um, Houston toad, uh, it's a very political uh, amphibian. Um, a lot of the political parts uh, date back to the like 1980s um, when they were putting in the um, golf course at Bastrop State Park. It, I can't remember if it was, if it was a nine hole course and they wanted to make it like a full course and then it was like, no, it's Houston Toad Habitat, and there was fighting about that. And there was a whole bunch of political uh, cartoons that came out during that time. Um, it is the first amphibian and the first species to be listed in Texas as an endangered species. So in the 1970s. Um, you can only find it in certain counties. So it's a, of course, that's what why you get endangered and threatened species to begin with is because they typically are habitat specialists, or they have a small niche that they can live in. Um, they're not a generalist. So uh, what we typically think of Houston toad habitat are these sandy loam soils um, that you see in Bastrop County, where you have like the lost pines. And like most amphibians, you have a ton of things that are leading to their decline. And just some of the things that the Houston toad face, they uh, breed in these shallow cattle ponds. And so you have cattle, you have feral hogs stomping the tadpoles um, while they're in the water. Red imported fire ants, as the toadlets emerge, the fire ants will go down to the edge of the water um, and, and eat the toadlets. And this is hog damage over here. Um, the Bastrop Buckies, not happy about beaver it. Beaver damage? What? Beaver damage. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Beaver damage, exactly. Well, this, you know, this was right. This is right. If y'all been there to see this Buckies, it's right there by Bastrop State Park, which has the highest concentration of Houston Code. So there was some habitat that was taken down from the budget. Um, we have this crazy person. So here's Bastrop State Park. And the story behind this is that he didn't, they told him that he couldn't clear his land. And he said, nope, I'm gonna clear my land anyways. And so he spelled his last name, Luki. From space. <laughs> from space. No, from, but like these are trees. Oh, okay. And he cleared everything else. And I'm not German, but I've been told Luki means gap, which is pretty ironic for what he just created in the habitat. He created a giant gap. Um, and then, of course, this was one of my steady toads, um, drought. This was before the 2011 fire. This was probably a month before um, how uh, dry we were. My, my toads were coming out of, um, from the sand emerging and just desiccating. So. 
a lot of things. Amphibians, yeah. That's why they call them the indic or indicator species. They breathe through their skin, so they're very sensitive to environmental changes. And then, of course, this happened, what, four days ago? Eight years ago? Um, September 4th, right? Is that right? September 4th, 2011. And so this, this became, this was not Bashop State Park, but this is what it looked like. This is a property that was next to it where we did our amphibian research. You see we have what's called a perp array set up to funnel perps into five gallon buckets. Um, and it was completely burned. So this was the Boy Scout Ranch. So I was looking at survivorships. And so just to give you an idea, another reason why these species are in decline, it's you think, okay, well yeah, amphibians, they're explosive breeders. Most of them are explosive breeders. So they have a really narrow window of time and they're gonna be in the pods and they're gonna be calling and they're calling the females in. Um, toad species are like this. So you can have one or two events a year where you're only getting breeding on those few days. Um, and so, yes, they lay a ton, a ton of eggs. But if you can look at the survivorship, we have wild toad survivorship estimates and then captive toad. So those tubs that I was showing you, those are captive toad where we get the estimates from there versus what we actually find in the wild and see how they survive. And so it just kind of shows you egg to an adult is 0.01% survivorship. Um, whereas if we raise these in captivity, or if we do what's called head starting, and taking wild toads, putting them into an environment we can control, and then releasing them at a stage that offsets those early um, mortality rates associated with like egg and tadpole, then you can get egg to metamorphosis 77% juvenile, the mature adult, to 24.6%. Uh, so versus two adults after your clutch size, you can get 250 adults, in theory, using the, the average math. Um, so is that still being done? It is. And so at the beginning of the stages, um, when I was doing it, well, we had, we had a student before me, and he was releasing toadlets. So raising, we were getting, we were finding wild egg strands, um, putting them in those blue tubs, waiting until they get to a certain size, and then releasing them. But we're releasing less numbers if we do that versus a whole entire egg strand. And then what we were finding is that everything in the world wants to eat a Houston toad in a tub. I had to figure out how to keep raccoons out. I have pictures of um, tree frogs getting in there, fat tree frogs. I know what they were eating. Uh, Gulf Coast toads getting in there. Um, I have photos of black widows with Houston toads dangling in their webs. So it was really tough. Um, but how nice of you to come to the <laughs> You know, I like the, the fact that my friends call me Mama Toad, <laughs> but it's really, it should be like, I probably have killed more Houston toads than anybody at Grace. Um, but we were learning. So, right, we were trying to protect them using netting. Um, and we were doing what we were calling head starting. We had not yet gotten a successful breeding to occur at the Houston Zoo. The Houston, I was working with, who is now our state herpetologist, Paul Crump from the Houston Zoo. Um, they have what's called the assurance policy, assurance colony of Houston toads, and it's toads from a whole bunch of different counties um, so that we can keep the genetic aspect of that population viable and we're not just kind of breeding to a bottleneck. We don't want that now. Um, so we started with head starting. So we actually still had breeding occur. We'd go out, listen to the calls. The next day, go and find the egg strands and then take them back to the house. So you're taking egg strands and not whole adults? Or are you taking We're taking egg strands from the wild, just okay. egg strands, egg. not adults. Okay. Just the egg strands. And then taking them back and raising them. How sensitive are amphibians to genetic bottlenecks? Very, they can be very sensitive. So that's the big, that's the bit, one of the biggest um, concerns with this population because instead of, well, got, we added Robertson County to the genetics, but we, we only had like, we only had about four or five counties. And as this kind of 
got um, going and monitored and how well it works. We were doing surveys wider, in a wider breadth, and then we, we found pockets of populations we didn't know. So this research kind of was able to get more people involved and more people paid to do a much more extensive survey, and we found we found quite a bit. So, but yeah, that's definitely a concern for this. So, are you putting the egg strands once they're hatched and head started back into the same ponds, or are you? Yes. Okay. Yes. That was yeah. That's what we were we were doing. So you can see, and I'll be honest, this is not a Houston joke. Egg strand. Um, my advisor always calls me out on it. He's like, "Why do you put this picture?" It's an American toad. Well, it's the closest related, and it's the best photo I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, not Houston toads. These are Houston toad tadpoles. So we raise them, the eggs go in there, we have the tadpoles, and then we have our cute little toadlets. And then we place them back into, or near, near, the, near the ponds um, where we collected them. Before we did that, we cut a little toe off of each one, and we were using genetic markers to determine the success of this head starting. So we release toads. How do we know if these toads survive and then they reproduce the next year? We did that by, again, using microsatellite data um, and also PCR, and every year... Hmm? The PCR? Polymese chain reaction. Polymerase chain reaction. Something like that. I haven't done it in so long. It's like, you, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. Um, and so what we were doing is we were comparing every year when we would go out to those ponds and collect toads or find adults, we would test their DNA with the ones that we released to see if we had any subships happen. Do we have brothers and sisters we're finding? Do we have maternal links? Um, and unfortunately, does it also say our gender? It does not. No, it's just, uh, I don't think, uh, they might be doing that now. This was just subships. So this was just, just curious, because I know things are sensitive with temperature changes, right. and I'm wondering if any of them were close to female. We were just looking at the percentage of relatedness, and that's how we could tell if, like, if they were brothers, or if they were siblings. I should, actually, I should say siblings versus um, parentals. Yeah. So this was uh, more of uh, a colleague before me, his research, and what he found out is that Sally. Houston toad survivorship is at 0.01%. If we did head starting like we did, it's still at 0.01% survivorship. He found one toad that was related to one of the ones that we had released. So it's like, what do we do? Okay, maybe we're not releasing enough into the wild since we're releasing toadlets. Their survivorship is a lot lower. Let's try something else. Let's try egg strands. Yes, egg strands are going to get predated. Um, probably easier than tadpoles and easier than toadlets. Um, you know, a, a great blue heron can come down the pond and decimate a whole entire egg strand and, uh, and um, uh, tadpoles. As well as, I mean, you've got every aquatic invertebrate that is, is going to eat the eggs. And then you have spade foot toad, toad uh, tadpoles that are very carnivorous. And so we have data of them eating the Houston toad tadpoles or eggs. But Houston Zoo is able to now get us to breed in captivity and started sending us eggs. So instead of maybe releasing 500 toadlets, we were releasing 250,000 eggs to see if that worked. And so we noticed that we were having a predation issue, so I built this little egg exposure contraption, and this was successful. Um, we could get the eggs to hatch into tadpoles, and then the tadpoles get big enough to where we could take the egg exposure off, and then they would disperse um, in the pond. And then we would see toadlets pretty, about 30 to 40 days afterwards. Let's see. The tadpoles in there. So this is, this is kind of in the stage that um, Texas State is in. Unfortunately, in 2015, when I graduated, um, I didn't find any toads that were related 
Uh, I released over 500,000 eggs. Um, we got really efficient with this. And so the next year, I think they released close to a million eggs. Um, and so over time, we just worked, we kept it up, we kept it up, we kept it up, and kept up the monitoring. And then just a few years ago, we started getting our return on that. And we were getting uh, paternal pits, we were getting uh, siblings, and we were finding toads at ponds that we hadn't had toads at in years that we had been supplementally putting these extracts in. So my data doesn't get to show that, sadly, but I am a part of that bigger research, so you'll see that. Um, it's just someone else gets to say that, woo, it worked, and not me, sadly. Um, so do you think you will get to the point where you're placing so many toads that you're over the capacity of the habitat that's there? No, I don't think that I don't think that um, is an issue because I don't think our survivorship is high enough yet. Uh, one of the concerns with Houston toads is that so they breed in these artificial ponds. Um, these ponds go dry. Uh, there's sometimes too, the, the ponds are too wet and we have too many ponds. And what we're thinking is that they're just not dis dispersing as far as they should. And so you have males calling. Instead of everything coming together in like a concentration of one pond and you get multiple males calling, there's so many ponds out there because everybody's got a cattle pond that males are calling, but the data shows that a female will not go to a pond if at least three males are not call are calling. And I don't know where they came <laughs> up with that number, but I think it has something to do with like either, uh, the theory is either like they can't necessarily hear the males from where they are, or it's just not loud enough to be like, hey, the males are over there, I wanna go somewhere else. You know, there's not enough of them. <laughs> right, so. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't think we'll ever get to that point with, with these guys. <clears throat> Those little fences that you put in, are they metal? Is that why they survive that other pond? Because I was thinking it was that cloth that they use for erosion control. No, and so some people do those. Uh, that was galvanized aluminum flashing. So it did make it through the pond. Yeah, the galvanized will make it through. But just the regular aluminum flashing won't. But we do. Galvanized. So it's like, okay. But we did have to rebuild a lot of it. So some of the stuff I did in, in Kings Canyon, this is in California. These are the mountain yellow leg frogs. Uh, again, another endangered species. Um, I think it was listed fairly recently. Um, these guys have a lot of problems because first of all, this area of California has chytrid fungus and this population of frog is very susceptible to it. So Texas, we have chytrid fungus in our amphibians. Um, however, we're not seeing these mass die-offs of, of frogs like we are in the Sierra Nevadas, and we think a lot of that has to do with the temperature um, and how chytrid reacts to different temperatures. We think it's just too hot for chytrid to really grasp and, and, and take its population down here. And then it could also be that the species we have can are they just not affected by it. Um, but this is one where you if you've seen the National Geographic picture. It's a, it's a pristine uh, stream in California and the mountains in the background and then there's like 50 frogs flipped upside down dead. We weren't really doing much with the kitchen, but what we were doing was eradicating, so all of these ponds where these, this frog lives is above 10,000 feet. And so these are high alpine lakes that should not have trout. But in the 1970s, they brought in these big plains and dug trout so people could fish. And you know, at the time, we didn't think it was going to be a, a bad thing. Um, and it turns out, because the trout aren't supposed to be here, these species that live here are now prey. Um, a neat thing about uh, the mountain yellow frog, also due to the temperature of the water, they go through metamorphosis very slowly. So, say a frog um, species that's a rana, so like our leopard frog here, in anywhere from like 40 to 60 days from egg to, to Four years. Wow. So they, yeah. So they're in that water with these carnivorous, carnivorous trout for four years. And so it was decimating population. So we went in and gill netted and electroshocked. Oh, so that's, this is that famous National Geographic photo. 
and that we were in this canyon. So our canyon luckily did not have. We were the one. There were we, there were three teams of us. Um, in my canyon, we did not have kitchen fungus, so we did not see this. Um, so that was good. So um, we were trying to get rid of uh, the non-native trout through uh, uh, electroshocking and gill netting and everything like that. But and so this tells you a little bit about kitchen. If you want to try to say that, I'm always diet it. Atricotritrium B, which is called BD, makes it easier to say, but yeah. And so it affects the keratin of their skin. And so again, amphibians are very susceptible because of their skin, they breathe through their skin, um, indicator species for that reason. So, and so it makes that keratinized skin so they can no longer breathe. So slowly, slowly suffocation, yeah. Nasty stuff. And so what you do for that is we we did not, we helped with the project with one of the professors that came down when he came to our canyon. Um, they swap, they swap uh, for, and then again, it's, it's another genetic test that they can tell if, if it has BD or not. So I don't really know too much about how the tests that they use for that occur. Not done any of that type of lab work. But, And so this is, I love this photo, but yeah, this is exactly what happened in the 1970s. The trout were like, what? <laughs> right? Wow. Are they still stocking? Or are they <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. They stopped. Yeah, they stopped in the, I think, in the early 90s. They stopped. Well, and the, also, the other thing is, too, is these weren't native trout. So not only were we putting in trout that aren't supposed to be there, we were putting in hybrids that outcompete the native trout if they were you know, they were dropped into other lakes. So, did the trout have the fungus? Or no. Were, no. Okay. Yeah, the, the trout and the fungus aren't related. It was just two two big things that are kind of hitting this population right now. And so, stocking not native fish. We started stocking in 1918, which is crazy, but. Um, we should not do that. We were upset. Again, our, the canyon that I worked in uh, had, had been uh, trapping non-native trout for, we were the seventh year. So we're super excited. We're like, yeah, we're going to eat trout all summer. This is going to be amazing. We caught two. <laughs> the other two group, they were saying like, oh, we were so sick of eating trout. And I was like, oh, it's not fair. <laughs> Oops. Wait, what's happening? <laughs> Like, <laughs> okay. That's how you electroshock. You didn't know on your side. <laughs> so what we would do is we would also go out and do um, surveys. And so we'd have to write down which year we thought the tadpoles were. You can tell the different sizes. So that was a little, you know, difficult to do. And I'm sure we got some wrong. But um, we spent hours and hours and hours. We had seven ponds that we would um, survey weekly. Um, and take numbers. And our, again, so since we didn't have kitchen and we didn't have trout, we had a ton of mountain yellow lake frogs, which is cool. And so this is looking down from one of our, this is one of our larger lakes. This is our campground area. Um, we are looking down. So the, the part that we're looking down on is a shelf that, right, non native trout should not ever be able to get up. So they should not. And this is how you electroshock, if you've ever done it before. Um, <laughs> it's the only photo that my, my partner got uh, for, uh, of me, and I was just like, why? Because you're always on the ground. Um, don't do that, but it's heavy. and <laughs> But it's, it's neat, you have, um, uh, what do you call it? Anode and cathode, and you, you hit a button and it shocks everything, but it does it just for a split second, so the fish will roll and then you scoop them up. And so we did this hour a day. You caught two. <laughs> and here's one. So this was the, that hybrid, uh, golden rainbow hybrid. And that was the largest one we got. So that's some of the amphibian work. Some of the reptile research is done right here in South Texas. And again, these are the harvest impacts um, that led to laws that we now have protected species. 
Um, and we also looked at bait switching. Um, do you, different types of turtle species, some eat meat, some eat vegetables. Um, we were switching bait, uh, different types of meat to see if we could recapture turtles do get smart and they don't want to go back in the traps. Um, we were also um, looking at hoop net, net escapes. So how efficient are these hoop nets to catch like soft shells is what we use. Um, if we put a soft shell in a trap, would that get us to catch more soft shells? And so we spent three years, I spent three years, this is us in uh, West Texas on the Rio, um, but we did the same thing down here at the Southmost Preserve. Um, this is us getting all of our bait cans, we're using sardines, getting ready to bait them. And so we always had a system, I was the front, so I was the bait person, I had it all at my feet, I smelled like fish for weeks. Um, Avani was the one who would take the turtles out of the trap and do all the measuring. And then we have Donald who was steering and taking the GPS locations in the back. Once we collected all of our turtles, we'd kind of have a little river party, um, do all the measurements, and then I'm taking a blood sample uh, for DNA. It's like right here. Um, and so some of the publications that have come out of this uh, of work, some, um, again, that have led to the laws uh, that we have changed, the decline of red eared sliders and Texas study soft shells in the lower Rio Grande, magnitude of uh, freshwater turtle exports from the U.S., modeling commercial freshwater turtle production um, for pets and meat markets. So all of this research was great. So here are our new rules in commercial harvest for the turtle. Um, Parks and Wildlife Commission this week voted to prohibit the commercial collection of four species of freshwater turtles in Texas. So we have the snapping turtle, red eared slider, smooth soft shell, and spiny soft shell are now protected. That was pretty cool. And that protection went in? Um, 2000, what are we, 19, 2018. 2018. And so some other quick uh, herpes final research that I've done, uh, Texas Tortoise Movement Study. Uh, this is with U.S. Fish and Wildlife over at Palo Alto Battlefield. Uh, we have over 300 tortoises marked, um, and they have a radio telemetry study that they were looking at uh, movements and pattern uh, uh, home ranges. Um, more Houston Tosa. And then this was a study again after the fire of what happened to the herb um on the Boy Scout Ranch. So that's just kind of a background of what I have done with uh, amphibians and reptiles. Um, again, some here in Texas and then some species that aren't, but the, but the, uh, the research would still be the same, how you would conduct it. here in the park um, about three months ago and it was in the it was in the um, parking lot area and it was gigantic um, so the ones that do survive get really big uh, otherwise these guys are that's their primary what they eat there are rattlesnakes yeah pretty cool and we've got really big indigo snakes here and they're protected they're a Texas protected species again I have to love to show people my snake photos I've already talked about that so, getting into herpetology, Greek, herpes, I'll say herpes, I mean, I guess you can say herpes, <laughs> then you're probably going to have your friends run away from you. Um, and it doesn't mean it's creepy things, and I don't think that's very fair. I mean, I think, I, but, but then again, I'm the girl who runs to the snakes, and I flee from a spider. 
And oh my gosh, those pal that, those American cockroaches, palmetto bugs, the big ones that fly and they get in your house, they get in the door, and all of a sudden they fly at you. I've had some, I've had some terrifying evenings in my apartment um, <laughs> after rain. Uh, <laughs> so I don't think they should be called creepy things. I don't think they're creepy at all. Um, but. I think they're horrible. But we have amphibians and we have reptiles, and we'll go through all the different uh, types. And so, one, salamanders, frogs, and toads are going to be common that you're going to see. Maybe not salamanders in Texas, maybe only the tiger salamander can be fairly common if you're raised out in West Texas. But um, never see the Sicilian, kind of below ground. Uh, it would really be cool to see one. And then reptiles, we've got turtles, lizards, alligators, and very mad at the San Diego Zoo for this. They have tataras, they do not have them on display. And it's that cool, like, lizard thing with the third eye. And... But it's not a lizard, but it's like a lizard. Apparently, it's like a lizard. It's like super soft. Are they like super shy? I mean, they have yeah. The eyes are a little paranoid, maybe? <laughs> I would, it, was, it would be a huge lifer for me. I mean, I'm never going to go to Australia to see one, probably, but the San Diego Zoo has them. Because they have a big thing that talks about them. And it's like, don't tell me you have them. And then you don't show them. So amphibian, Greek word meaning double life. Sometimes it's kind of a triple life, but yeah, they have an aquatic stage and they have a terrestrial stage. Some amphibians get caught in the aquatic stage. And so they remain their kind of juvenile neotenic uh, self um, for, the for, their life, for the rest of their lives. Um, you've got some salamanders like the red spotted newt. They have an aquatic stage, a terrestrial stage, and then they go back to the water. So it's kind of cool, <coughs> in the back aquatic. So, but double life, at some point they're in the water and they're on land for the most part. And again, we talked about them being indicator species because of their skin. Um, they're very susceptible to uh, environmental changes. So I'm not gonna hit every single one again, but we'll just go over some of the more common ones that we'll see. Um, oh, I haven't even gotten into that. I'm just telling you about salamanders. So the difference between a salamander, it is an amphibian. Um, most of them have four legs. The Ephiuma does not. Uh, aquatic and terrestrial species, so you have your mud puppy, they'll, they'll stay, or it's called the water dog. They're gonna stay aquatic their whole lives. Um, you have the uh, lungless Cephalodonids, and then your bigger salamanders, like your tiger salamander, is gonna be your amniosomatic, so. They're uh, aquatic, and these are the ones that some of them don't go through metamorphosis. They get caught in that uh, neotenic stage. So, what are the special species here? We do have them at Rostock de la Palma. Currently, uh, Dr. Drew Davis is doing a study here um, from UTRGV, and once a month they go out and they place uh, these. Um, I call them crawfish traps, but uh, out in the in our Rosacas, and they have caught these. So these are a protected species. Um, I think they've caught about six of them here, uh, which is kind of amazing to me because you think about it. Like a lot of people come to Rosaka, and yes, we have issues with water. We have to pay for our water. Um, sometimes we run out of water money and we have to let it dry. Sometimes we let it dry because we have to go in and do vegetation management. So we've had parts of these Rosacas dry for five, six months. And to know that these guys are somehow surviving down in the mud is super exciting. So that's kind of an adaptation that they have. Um, but we're, again, we're excited to have them here at the park. What we haven't found at the park yet, but very close, Palo Alto Battlefield. I, I wish I should add in my photo. I got to hold my first black spotted newt uh, about six months ago. And you, I mean, my face is just so cool. It was, it was a good day. Um, federally endangered, we did have a study, Dr. Klein, UTRGB. He's had students out here to put cover boards. We're still hopeful that we have this species. I think I think it's highly likely we do. If we have the siren that are so far, that the siren are surviving, we should have black spotted newts as well. So we're hoping that that research will show that we do have them. Um, Another way that they're trying to determine if there are newts and if there are sirens in types of rosacas besides trapping is they're also collecting eDNA, so environmental DNA. They're collecting water samples. 
Um, we tried to do this with Houston toads and it was uh, not successful, but if there's enough DNA in the water, um, especially for species that might be, their skin might be sloughing off like the sirens, then you can say there's presence absence just based off of the water and you don't have to collect the individual. So that's pretty cool. So how much does that sampling cost? I have no idea. And just, I think it really depends on if the university has the equipment to do it themselves or if they have to send their samples off for another university that has the equipment to do it. Does Rio Grande Valley have it? Texas State, we were very fortunate that we had um, uh, two different types of sequencing machines. So we never had to send samples off to anywhere. So we, we, it, was, it was very, very nice. So uh, what are probably the most common um, salamander, but again, you'll see them West Texas more often. Um, I caught a lot of them in Bastrop, uh, post fire actually. Uh, and then we have them down here after a rain, some really, really um, nice sized salamander, pretty uh, charismatic salamander. And these would be the ones that might retain their neotenic stage. They get confused. I've seen them sold at, at, at uh, bait stores as mud puppies. And they're, you know, I'm like, mm, that's not, it's, it's just an aquatic version of those. You mean they're stuck in that phase program? Mm -hmm. huh? Is that because of some environmental sensitivity? I, I don't know how to answer that question for you. I'd have to go read that in my books. Um, frogs and toads, a lot of different species. Largest group that we have, we probably have more frogs here in Texas than a lot of other states. Um, <laughs> sometimes they're smooth, sometimes uh, they can be a little warty. Uh, so. And that grosses people out, which I haven't quite figured out. Like, is it you that won't touch the toad, or is that Adriana? Oh, we had we asked her to go get a little toadlet and take a picture of it. She's like, I don't want to touch it. It's like, ah, oh, the toadlet. So cute. <laughs> and I think that they have the strangest reproductive um, capabilities. Uh, the Pippa Pippa. I used to show this when I taught middle or uh, was a, a, a fellow. At a middle school um, while I was going through uh, Texas State, Ugh. I used to gross students out with it. It actually grosses me out. They lay their eggs on their back, and then the tadpoles bore into the back of the mother. Oh, wow. And then when they hatch, the, I, the, the video that I had it, like put it to music, and it was all of a sudden just you see the little arms just start sticking out, and then heads, and then they go back in, and then eventually this, this toad just like pops out of her back. And it's multiple of them. I'll bring up the video if you've got the mother left after all that. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, her back keeps outer space to look for her back. <laughs> That's an extreme. <laughs> and then you have like the gastric. So uh, and I don't think we have any strange breeding amphibians in, in the United States. It, you know, our environment isn't quite as tropical or as harsh or anything like that. But then you have like the gastric brooding frogs where they swallow their tadpoles, they hatch, and then regurgitate them. Out. Works for them. Um, there's some there's some uh, amphibians that lay like just one uh, egg, and they do it on um, the bromeliads. And then when they hatch, they like will take carry one tadpole at a time all the way up the tree, up to the top of the bromeliads, to drop them into water that is collected inside of yeah. And that uh, there's a there's a species that does that in Ecuador, and so yeah, strange different ways. Um, this would be a lifer for me. Starting in the state of Texas, I really, really, really want to um, go out and see. I want to see one, but I really want to hear one. But with Texas being you know 95 percent privately owned, and we love our guns. Um, I'm not brave enough to drive around in the dark uh, and try to find them. So, but I have heard Star Star in Zapata County, especially after heavy, heavy rains, there are people that know exactly where to go, um, and you can hear them. Uh, and so there, I, 
they're not, I wouldn't say, an explosive breeder. They're an opportunistic breeder. They spend the entire life almost underground. And then when that one rain event, it doesn't have to be every single year. It could be, you know, if we don't get a lot of rain for, for three years, then they just don't have a breeding of it. And then when that rain does, it's like massive explosive breeding. So, but that's a special one that we have in the valley. Probably one of my favorite amphibians can be this guy, Calchi. Spade foot toads. Um, they're called that. They have a, they're, they dig, they're diggers, so they spend a lot of time underground. But on their back hind legs, they have, it's a black, it's called a spade. Um, and we have three different types. The probably more common you're going to find is Herderi. That's what we trap a lot in bass trap. But I have found Calchi here as well. And then we do have Bomba fronds. So, super, super big eyes. So they're just, they're just adorable. It should be like in the Hobbit or something. Bomba fronds. It does. <laughs> um, another uh, important species that we have is the Rio Grande chirping frog. We have two types of chirping frogs in Texas. As you can see, the two different populations here. Um, ours, it's they're still the Cirophis genus, except it's just your your subspecies is going to be different. Um, at night, you'll hear them if you ever kind of go outside. It's kind of like because um, they're also they're also you can find them. Um, in urban areas. Uh, you go out at night and you hear like <laughs> those are the chirping frogs. So they're hard to see though. So you unless you I've only ever found one because we were trapping and they fell into the pitfall trap. Other than that I'll, I'll hear them all the time and they're just so tiny you just can't see them. Stay endangered, again, this would be a lifer for me. The white Mexican white frog is only found in three counties in Texas. So. I've not found one here, but I haven't done extensive amphibian surveys here. Another state threatened amphibian we have, Mexican tree frog. This is a very large tree frog. Um, I, it, what you don't see is that you don't see the range that extends into Mexico. So more, most of these species that are like the state threatened or state endangered, they're more of a uh, Mexico, Central America species and their population just happens to get to us because of, of the habitat, the, the, the habitat type that we have here. And then sometimes you'll get these random, see you'll have uh, question marks. Amphibians can get transferred, even, even Mediterranean geckos and, and, and gnolls can get transferred easily in potted plants. So you, that's where these random like um, records might be. They were transferred to potted plants. So. My favorite, cane toad. Uh, there's an extensive range. Um, the, the Cameron County population isn't very large. It's more Hildalgo Star County, where you start getting some more of them. Um, very, very large toad. treat the population in a sense as kind of continuous, but when we talk about United States populations and Texas populations, since we, it's considered this, it's considered state threat. Um, we don't, and I'm not saying that all the time, we don't help, we don't manage the same way that Mexico does, but since we manage our populations, that's kind of, and then how our state laws are developed as well, we have state laws that protect them, whereas if we use the whole range, then they would be State. Or they would, yeah. So. For just our state, for our state laws. 
we don't have very many of them. So we have our sheep frog, um, another one I have not seen, uh, very closely related to the narrow mouth toad. Uh, and they do, narrow mouth toads sound like, they sound like sheep to me. Um, so I haven't heard what these guys sound like, but I'm gonna go, it's pretty similar. <laughs> Yeah, if it's called a sheep frog, I'm gonna go with they probably named it that. It doesn't look like a sheep. Um, so I'm gonna go with it because it sounds like a frog. So do they have that yellow looking stripe mm -hmm. consistently across the I have, I've looked at a couple of pictures of them and then yeah, that they do. It's all okay. it's all a different pattern. Yeah. So reptiles that we have down here. Texas tortoise. So this is a, a well, we're, we'll talk about types of tortoise in a minute. Um, we're talking about the non-avian reptiles. Okay, so I have to tell you a story. I was really upset. My friend Cynthia the other brought. She's getting ready to have a baby like any day. We might have to rush her to the hospital in 10 minutes. Who knows? I bought her a t-shirt from Walmart. I thought it was adorable because it said Re reptile expert. I didn't take the time to see the animals that were on the shirt. So I get home and I'm like wrapping it and I'm like, first of all, that's a salamander. And second of all, that is a frog. <gasps> I was so offended. Did you tell Walmart? Oh, I know. Walmart, the market, I took the shirt back. <laughs> it's like, no, I can't have her baby wearing that. That's the Walmart corporate. You can't uneducate that. <laughs> Not a reptile. <laughs> oh. But when we talk about reptiles, so, uh, so I sent that out on Facebook, and my buddy was like, he made a joke. He's like, it would have made sense if they would have put a bird. And I said, I know. That would have at least been, you know, next to Sort of <laughs> so we're talking about the non-avian avian reptiles. Dry, scaly skin. Um, again, uh, or you know, they get their term temperature based off of the weather. They're not internally able to deal with their temperature. Um, lay soft-shelled eggs, typically, um, kind of leathery, mushy, on three-chambered hearts. Except crocodilians have four chambers. Lizards and snakes, largest group. Um, they all have uh, the reproduc reproductive organ, honey peens. People always ask me, how do you sex a turtle? How do you sex a snake? Uh, well, you can either figure out how to pop out the honey peens. Um, I've never, I've never been good at that. You can probe them, and apparently with snap, uh, uh, snapping turtles, um, Dr. Rhodes, who does all of the study and research on turtles. You flip them upside down, right? No, you, you hold them by their front legs, which I'm like, how do you do that with a snapping turtle? <laughs> or you didn't, you shake it. Uh, and then the honeybee just does the job. You look it. It's funny. So I don't try to sex with these animals. The only ones I know for sure that you can do would be turtles, and we'll talk about how you, you know if it's a male or female with, um, with turtles. But right, you have live birth, you've got eggs, and then you've got live eggs inside birth. Um, and then, this is really cool because we have these. Uh, you have some that can reproduce asexually. So are whip-tailed lizards. Uh, Nemodophorus, I guess they are now, I can't think of the new genus. They change genus species names all the time. Um, so I use the old ones. I'm still a bufo girl. I'll never be anaxorous uh, when it comes to toads. It's still bufo. Um, but we'll talk about the whip-tailed lizards. So, state threatened, regal black striped snake. Uh, the only way that you're probably gonna end up finding these is if you like to flip a lot of logs. They're, they're not fossorial, but they like to be down in the leaf litter. <coughs> so um, they're not gonna be a common snake you're gonna find just kind of crawling around. Um, we do have these here in the park. So <laughs> flip a lot of logs, if you wanna look for them, but please put the log back gently where you breathe. So not rocks, they would prefer a gently under some kind of work. Yeah. And are they nope. Nope, 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 not um, We only have two species down here in the valley that are that are venomous. Well, okay. well, we'll get to technically what you can consider a venomous snake, but only two species that would harm you. Mm -hmm. um, of course, one of our favorites, uh, Texas indigo snake. Tons of them. Fantastic. Get very big. Note to self, um, what I have heard, and just you can be the judge of this if you want to try, they're very docile. 
um, the big ones are very docile. I mean, I guess I can think of it as like, well, they just kind of have, I mean, some, like, instead of the water snakes are super, super pissy snakes. You grab them, they're going to swing around, and they're going to hang on, and they're going to chew on you. These guys, you pick them up, and they're just like, huh. Um, I'm still very hesitant with the really large ones because these are not constrictors. The way that they kill their prey is they crush their mouths. So I don't want them to crush my arm. Um, so I've never been actually been bit by a large one. However, a little tiny guy got into our into our visitor center, and so I'm doing um, snake. <laughs> I'm just doing like snake fungal disease, so we have to swab the snake. Well, that little guy didn't like me swabbing his head. Oh, I've been bit by an indigo snake now. Yeah. They're little and they don't like all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it didn't hurt, but I was just like, oh, well, they say they're not mean. I guess when you're rubbing their face 30 times with a Q-tip, they don't like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, this, I do have this lifer. Um, the only place that I have known people to see them have been at Southmost Preserve and I think Sable Palms. Sable that uh, Southmost Preserve is where I saw mine. Um, we traced one into uh, Max Pond had a huge thing of pallets, um, and we chased one into there. And all I remember, this was in 2004, we were doing a herb field trip when I was a master's student, and my advisor was just like, you better get me that snake. <laughs> like screaming at us, and he is like a big man. And so we're just like terrified grad students. Like, Please let that snake be at the bottom. And it was gorgeous. Probably the most pretty or beautiful snake I've, I've ever seen. So I'm glad I've seen one. I would love to see another one. And then what did your advisor do with that snake? I don't remember. <laughs> Take it away? I don't remember. We did. I'm sure we took a DNA sample. Oh, but left the DNA sample. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, left it there for sure. But yes, gorgeous snake. Um, yeah. That brings up kind of a point. There's a lot of, you hear people like pro, going out and collecting, and not collecting, collecting, but going out and, like for my, I had natural, I had natural vertebrate history class. And so Dr. Simpson would take us on these field trips. And for grad students, we had to bring him back and identify four, like four snakes, four turtles, four lizards, and then go back and release it, but just make documentation of it. Um, I thought that was a great way to learn. Um, we did put everything back, but then you, I can also see the flip side where it's, you're, you're, you know, you're bothering the snakes, you're bothering the animals, you shouldn't touch them. But could um, you do those measurements in the field? We did. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. so, you yeah, did that so under a research system. permit. If you not had a research permit, it would be considered harassment. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, but I mean, I see that. Like state parks, um, we, we let research happen. Like she was saying, if you have a research permit, we don't let herpetology classes come to the state park to catch things. Yeah. So. We go to Southwest Preserve, and more where Max lets do that. It's a different thought process, right. and it's like no arrest, no. Mm -hmm. Well, that's state law that you can't harass. Yes. Yeah. And farm. And I think every state has the same types of laws. Have people that live there in the litter or by by it. And then you have herpetologists, and you have herp collectors, mm. completely different types of people. Your, herp, your herpetologists are more of your biologists. They know the natural history of the animals, and they leave the animals there to take photos and all of that. Your herp collectors, you know, they could just be wanting the fanciest, flashiest snake from, from somewhere. Um, I don't know if y'all heard about the North Carolina guy that got bit by this king cobra. When, when did Allie get it? Three years ago, um, I knew him because I used to be president or vice president of North Carolina Herpetolog Herpetological Society. Mm -hmm. um, but he was a herp collector. He had so many different exotic types of snakes in his house. So um, far so, ago. As far as like, you know, I, I've known like I used to I used to intern at the at the, at the San Antonio Zoo, and those guys were crazy herp collectors, where they had the shoe box full. Uh, I don't want a shoebox or a closet full of shoeboxes of snakes. And that's the setup, and it's strange. And I don't have a snake. I have a dog and a cat. So. <laughs> Speaking of cats, 
Um, another really neat species, uh, again, I've only heard really of reports of finding them down at South Coast Preserve. Um, it's a life, it would be a life for me. They come out at night. Uh, they're, they're one of the few uh, species of snakes that we have that has vertical pupils that's not venomous. Um, usually in the United States, if it's got a vertical pupil, then it's a venomous. We only have one species without a vertical pupil. It's our only a lapid, and that's the coral snake. And that's going to have the round pupil. But, but United States, is, you can use that almost like just stay away with something with a vertical pupil. You go to Australia, um, you, probably, you can't get away with that. Australia, all that. Um, they have a ton of lapids and they have the, the round pupils. These are very common as well, our roof vines, our shop, and then again you can see there's different subspecies. These are just recent records. But we have the roof vines, but then people here, these, these are called the shots. Whoop snake, very, very fast snake. Um, we've caught a couple of them around our building. They get up on the sidewalk here and they can't grasp with their scales, so they can't, they can't get away from you very fast. Um, I see a lot of these as DORs, which is crazy because they're a fast snake. One of my favorites, but probably the meanest snake out there is the diamondback water snake. Um, again, all, all of the water snakes are very, they have just this bad, bad temper. Um, but these guys, I think they can get really big and they're stinky. Most bluebirds are stinky, but these, I think it's because they eat fish maybe all the time and so and that, that's their defense mechanism too they bite but then most of the clubbers will rub their cloaca all over your arm and it just has a very musty smell and so for most animals we'll just drop it because it stinks um that's another reason why like the hog nose does the whole feigning and then flips over and his tongue goes out and then, and like the clo yeah it releases stuff from its cloaca just to smell it so so does this one, if there's low branches over a stream or a creek, they will go up in the branches? Oh, yeah. so, yeah. More time, nine times out of ten, so we don't have uh, cotton mouths down here, um, but you'll see videos on TV about, you know, venomous snake falls in a boat, and it's nine Just times out of ten, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a water snake, yeah, because they will fall into your boat. And everybody's surprised. <laughs> um, second most common, I think, we have here in the park, you go down to our sockets. And that's our Gulf Coast ribbon snake. Real pretty. Um, I'll see them. I'll see them uh, hunting on the water's edge very, very often. If you go to Astero, they have this little creek, kind of in the back where you can enter. Um, if you're an employee, and there's always one or two of them sitting in there. So one of our two venomous snakes. We do. Oh, we had a cool video, uh, which I should put on here. Um, is this is our coral snake, Texas coral snake. Uh, I've seen a few in the park now. Uh, I've been told in the past they love this leaf litter that's out in the um, island area of our parking lot. But one day I got a call, I was in the park and, and they wanted me to come back here. And so there was a coral snake right here in the front gardens and it was eating um, a baby rat snake. And then there was a second dead rat snake next to it. And after it ate the first one, we're like, there's no way it can fit a second one in its mouth. It ate both. We sat there and watched the whole thing. And I had never seen a coral snake get so fat because they're super, super skinny. And they're very twitchy snakes. They're one of the ones that I would not ever mess with when we had to take samples. I, I would two copperheads. That was about it. These guys, I would not to. Um, very dangerous. Uh, we had Venom ER come to us and talk at one of our North Carolina Herpetological Society meetings. And the anti venom for these guys is so expensive to make, and so few people get bit by them that they really have stopped production. So it's not one um, that that uh, you would want to get bit by. Yes, they can easily bite you. They don't have to chew on you. Um, they have they have teeth, um, and they're just twitchy. The only thing I would worry about these is if you have small kids and there's a snake in the back. They're pretty, so the kid might think it's a toy. Our only rattlesnake that we have down in the valley. If you've ever been to Palo Alto Battlefield, they probably have some of the biggest and the most 
amounts of rattlesnakes, or it could just be because I'm crawling through the brush looking for Texas tortoises and also looking for rattlesnakes. Um, we got 14 one morning just on the radio, just rattlesnake, everybody watch out, rattlesnake. And they'll be in the same burrow, or like, Texas tortoises don't really burrow, they call what's called a pallet. Other gopher uh, types of tortoises, like gopher tortoises, they'll actually burrow underground and they'll stay there. These guys just pallet and they'll pallet under uh, prickly pear. Well, so do the, the uh, Aatrox like to go under the prickly pear as well. So we've got plenty of photos of the tortoise and the, the snake sitting next to each other mm -hmm. um, from surveys. So they'll, get back. they'll coexist, yeah. Um, but they're an important species to have around. They eat rodents. Rodents carry disease. It's hard to get people's brains wrapped around that. Um, I have a friend who is, uh, 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 he runs quail dogs for the King Ranch. And he has lost dogs to rattlesnakes. And so he's had to tell me, hey, I have to kill these rattlesnakes because if we have to protect our dogs, our dogs are what, you know, the hunters that makes, makes the money. So I understand there's like a give and take with that. If you have small kids and you have one in your back, backyard, you don't want to, to have them around. This is the native gecko. Texas banded geckos. I've never seen one down here. You have to flip rocks again. Um, I've seen them out in the big bend area flipping rocks. The difference is going to be their tail, the banding of the tail, um, and that's how it's spotted. And it's, and it's going to have a very smooth skin versus the non native. And I don't know if I put the non native picture on here. Nope, I didn't. Um, the non native is your Mediterranean gecko, or what they call your house gecko. And they're the ones that are super translucent. You'll see them at night next to your lights. Um, Non-native species, uh, we have it everywhere in Texas almost. Um, probably came over with potting plants. Uh, out competes the native species, and we'll see that with the green anole and the brown anole as well. Crotophytus, we have different types. We have polaris and reticulatus. The one that we have more down here is the reticulatus, the polaris is out here. Very large, large lizard. Let's say body is about this big, tail uh, long, and their head is massive. Um, I haven't seen very many of them, but it's an impressive lizard to find in more desert areas. And then of course our favorite, which is kind of a sad story with these guys. They used to, I mean, I, I, my dad lived in Oklahoma, and he was like, we always played with the horny toads. We had them everywhere. And then I've heard of other people say that about Texas. And I can probably tell you I've only seen maybe three in my life. And that's like going out and looking for them. And it's been kind of in the Catula area. Um, how long the battlefield sees them? We, I have yet to see one here in our park. Uh, but uh, horned lizard, right? The horned lizard populations, they eat the harvester ants. Yes, sister. Aren't they threatened? Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, they are. I add like them. Um, they eat the harvester ants. The harvester ants are being, uh, well, gosh, well, the crazy ants take take over harvester ant nests. Um, so we have that invasive species ant. But then red important fire ants come in and move the harvester ants out. But these guys don't eat the red important fire ants. So they're losing their food source. Um, I think at one point there was also problems with pet trade. But now it's I think it's more of habitat. Uh, degradation, um, and then your non-native species coming in here and out competing their food source. And then a neat adaptation for them, um, if they feel threatened, they shoot blood out of this, the corner of their eye. Yeah. And so, um, the only place that I've seen uh, the blue spine is these are probably the largest of the scoloporus. Um, if you go to Benson and you go to the pavilion at Benson Rio Grande Valley State Park at around 10 o'clock in the morning, the whole side of the pavilion will be covered with the, with the blue spines. Mm -hmm. And why at 10 o'clock? It's not too hot yet. Oh, okay. That side of the building hasn't gotten <laughs> the heat yet, yeah. And they're, they're not easy to catch. You, just, you basically have to do some catching. The ones that you're going to see at Rosaka are going to be more your Texas spines. And 
and they can get they can get pretty big as well. But these are your most common here. And you're on the trampolines, you'll probably saw them scurrying. The Texas finies and the whittail lizards are the ones that will scurry across the trampolines. I think the chicken like the squirrels that you. So these are native, and the fox squirrels are not. And then here's our sad story with our knolls. Uh, I don't can't remember the last time. It's been a couple of months before that I've seen a green knoll. What you're finding are the non-native invasive brown knolls. I live in an apartment complex in Harlingen, and we're just covered in brown knolls. And again, they're, they're, they outcompete the green knolls, the native species. That seems how they always worked. Um, little common guy, we have a skink. We have a couple of skinks, but this is going to be your co most common skink that you're going to see. Again, it's another leaf litter species, really tiny. Um, yeah, brown. And the skinks will drop their tails like no tomorrow. Um, I don't. I try not to mess with skinks too much. Um, I hated when I had to do the research and take them out of the buckets. Almost every time they would drop their tail, and I would upset them. Uh, here's our cool, here's our cool species. So we have these three different species of whittails. We have Larus sexlinius and Laredo wisis. So these two species um, mate to create uh, the uh, asexual species Laredo wisis. Asexual, completely. So that's the little line on that one. Mean no, like so, we have we have species now that they so asexually that they can reproduce. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, um, there's a couple of species like that, but yeah, these two will create an all-female version. Um, and then there's species that will be all female, and they will still be able to reproduce even though they're all female. And these are your whittail lizards. And we've got uh, we've got a couple of of professors at an LSU that are um, doing that research. And then glass lizards are, are really neat. People call them snakes. They have no legs, um, but they're lizards. They're not inside, is that right? So in evolution, it's easier to lose things than to gain. And so how these guys evolved is that they just lost their limbs. And that's how snakes did too. Snakes lost their limbs so that they could move through the grass, through the habitat instead of gaining legs later on. And then a few of the turtles that we have. What? Am I going on time? Okay, cool. Um, the yellow mud turtles, you don't see these often unless you're trapping for them. They stay in mud. Uh, neat little guys that we have all over the state. This was not in any of our harvest studies that we did. These are small, fairly small. They don't, they're not harvested. Um, Pseudomys gorzugi is a special species. This is a species that is state threatened. We have a lot of research being done. Um, and if you see the population of where the species is, it follows the Rio Grande River. The problem with how this species is moving, and it's causing bottlenecks in a sense, of, uh, of the populations of reproducing is we've got two dams that sit along the river and these species aren't able to move up and down or up the dams so there's a lot of study going on if we even have populations um, down in the lower Rio Grande River area anymore native species gorgeous species very large river um, you can see the bright bright Orange sometimes looks hot pink. Can you redesign the habitat of those two dams so that the turtles could go around them? So the the research that's being done right now um, is they're putting cameras. So Dolan Falls area of Devil's River, they're putting cameras on the turtles to see if they're if they're really having if they're struggling or if they are maneuvering. Um, around it and right now they're finding some turtles have been able to maneuver around they're not really quite sure how but they're getting there uh, they're, they're doing cameras and I think GPS, yeah GPS um, but they're having to go way out of their way 
uh, to do that. So that's that stuff that is still in the works right now. And I haven't, I haven't, I was trapping turtles with them about four years ago to put the, the, the cameras and all that on them, but I haven't, I haven't heard how that, but it's ongoing and Drew Davis out of UTRGB, he, what he's doing is he's doing again ED, ED, uh, EDNA for these guys, also drone footage. Mm -hmm. So they're able, his software that he's using for the drones are able to differentiate the turtle. Like he can see, he can identify Morzugi versus a red eared slider. Um, yeah, yeah, because I think it's taking video and they're getting, they're just going right along and they're looking for turtles that are out um, sunning themselves on logs. So that is something he just started about six months ago. So there's, there's a lot of research with these two right now. Ornate box turtle. I have actually have an example of one here. Um, we have them down here. I don't see them often. Again, they're more of a species I see in West Texas, um, or that I see in like Central Texas. The Lost Pines had a pretty good population of them. Um, we have a ornate, well, not an ornate. We do have a box turtle watch program. Uh, if you go to TPWD, um, you can print out uh, a form, and so every time you see one, you can write the data down and then send that off. Um, so that the um, biologists will have indications of where these turtles are found. <coughs> and then our state threatened. They're state threatened, but the population down here in the valley, I think is doing really well. Um, we have a great, it appears to be, I'm doing, um, I'm currently doing in this part, uh, population study in a sense. Um, it's more of a visual encounter survey, and then if I find one that I don't have marked, I will mark it. And then if I recapture it, I will write down the data and then slowly put together the polygons of their home range. And then like how many different individuals I have. Um, that's slow because it's visual encounter, so I have to physically be seeing them when I drive the tram loop. And I'm not at this park. Um, all the time. So I rely on our tram drivers and they write the data down for me. So I have locations of where we're finding our tortoises here, um, but they're not yet trained on how to identify or even mark a tortoise if they find one. So, uh, how, how big are their home ranges? I have to take that data from uh, Palo Alto Battlefield, but that's, uh, it's, I wouldn't be able to know exactly, give you like an acreage size. Um, but the data, we had one that was from a Loma um, on one side of the park and it had moved within a day over a mile. So we don't, we did not expect that tortoise to move that far, okay. uh, especially in that time frame. So they're still kind of trying to figure out, making sure that that's not a fluke. Um, or so if somebody, that was, that was, that was another, mm -hmm. that was another I thought that they had had that someone picked it up. Um, they thought it could just be a younger male and he was kicked out of his territory and he was just searching for his own spot um, because they are territorial. Yeah. Is that one of your own pictures? Do you remember? Yes, these are mine. So, um, mud cracks can be various sizes. About what size is this animal? Oh, um, I think this one was only, it wasn't a very large. Just a quick glance by scoots so or you probably look at it kind of aged. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, we used to count rings for box turtle studies. That could give you, if you if you had that individual marked and you counted the rings, um, and you were studying them for years and years and years, you could just guesstimate like, okay, well we know this turtle has been in our study for ten years, um, but we would not We can't do a scoop. But we but we wouldn't be able to get an exact age even if you counted. I mean, you can get one. Like, you can get an approximate. I, there could be, yeah, I don't know if there's a plus or minus, but we would we would count them and write it down, but we wouldn't go like, this is this age. I mean, we couldn't definitively say that. How do you mark them? Uh, we have, I use a file. Okay. And so I have different numbers on these scoots, and I only use certain scoots on the sides and in the back where the marginal um, scoots flare out. And so I file, I file them. So they've got a little bead tick marks. Um, not a herbie to love, but a pain in the 
on the side. <laughs> and that's how we did all the other turtles. Soft shells are a lot harder to mark, and I kind of felt bad for those. We would actually sketch a number on the back. And then we would take a little piece of their shell, like a little diamond for the DNA mm -hmm. tissue. I've heard that the Texas horses that if you pick them up, they can like release all their water. Is that true? Like, should you not pick them up for? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I wouldn't uh, because they are a protected species. Um, if it's like drought conditions, like right now, I'm very hesitant to take measurements if I find any turtle. What I, I do is I want to mark them. Um, but I, I, if I really just want to know if it's the sex, I just kind of put my hands up underneath them and not lift them off the ground. And if they're concave, they're a male. And if they're fairly flat, they're a female. Um, the males are concave because they get up on the back of the shell. Uh, and, and with Texas tortoises, it's very dramatic between concave and not. Uh, box turtles, not much. Um, but if they're in the middle of the road, move them off the road, yes. In the direction they were going. But yeah, they will, especially if they're, um, I think with the heat too, not only, not only are they stressed out, so I think they have a tendency to release their water um, defensively easily when it's hot versus when it's not. So um, I've had a couple of them, like, I really felt bad afterwards. I'm like, shoot. Uh, but I needed the data. But it was, seems like it's always been when it's really hot. So. Soft shells. These guys bite, and it hurts. Like, they're really, really, really bitey. Oh, I got bit in the back right here. Uh, remember that canoe photo? And I'm in the front. Well, we have a system. We go so fast. The three of us work together. My assistant is throw sardines, put the lid, toss back here. Ivana's in the middle. She's got the turtle. You hold it like a bowling ball. I forget how we hold it. Well, she had it like this, and she was doing something. And all of a sudden, I was like, I'm getting stung. I'm getting stung. I'm getting stung. And I hear her go, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Turtle reached out and slapped it. Got me. Luckily, it was what we called our standard size, which isn't a standard size, but for whatever reason, we were trapping in, in a big bend in that area. They were all about 300 grams, so they were only this big. But these softies, I'm sure y'all have seen them sometimes um, uh, out sunning. I mean, they can get big. And that's really hard to get a soft shell that big out of a, uh, a trap and a snapping turtle. It's really hard to get out of a trap. Kips. We, I'm not, I don't think I went through all the, the turtles because every single one is critically endangered, but our, our South Padre Island and Boca Chica Beach um, is prime nesting habitat for Kim's Ridley. I think we had 64 nests this year. Um, I volunteered on ATV uh, patrol um, during the, the season, and I've gotten to see my first mama. I was so excited. Um, but South Padre Island is known, Sea Turtle Inc. This is a very important species for Texas. Um, all the way up the Texas coast, almost to Galveston, um, is where it was weather nesting down into Mexico. So. And then we only have the one American alligator. It's a comeback success story. We almost lost the population in Texas. And then um, through hunting laws uh, and uh, I think they did the captive breeding program with these guys releasing them. Now we've got nuisance gators so much that South Padre Island now has nuisance gators that they, I guess uh, the, the birding center now has the gator rescue because we have so many nuisance gators. So if you like alligator, get your hunting permit for the alligator, get your one. And then I think that's about what, because I think this goes into all the research that I started talking to you guys about. So. We have fun. <coughs> we have fun.